started out worshiping for the start out of a good season in our lives. Uh, a couple of things that I would uh, let you know. One of them is that the secretary's been at it again. Uh, the second song is number 299, rather than 298. We're not going to sing the same song twice. But you just, you just turn one page and you're there. Uh, also, we're going to be playing a little bit by, uh, by uh, ad lib on communion this so uh, we're going to be flexible today as we take communion. But I would like you now to stand up as we uh, join together as to a call to worship.
on a failure patient, uh, do some rehab uh, so she can get up and be walking again. And we're uh, we're going to pray for her continued uh, uh, improvement. Lord, in your mercy. Take a moment and put ourselves into the presence of God. God of life, victor over death, we come to remember who we are and whose we are. We do not belong to ourselves, we belong to you. Out of our identity, we can know what to say and what to do. We come to express our love for you. You have stood by us through the good times and the bad ones. Sometimes we cannot see you clearly, but later we see that your footprints are right there beside us. We come to express our love for our neighbor. Sometimes they're not very lovable, but they are our brothers and sisters. Loving our neighbor means taking care of their needs. Sometimes that doesn't come naturally. So we'll have to ask you to give us a hand. Open our ears to hear your word. Sometimes it calms us down. Sometimes it stirs us up. Help us to see you in both. We wait now for a word from Jesus. And he gives us one in the form of a prayer. When he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. One, uh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, during the prayer time uh, to pray for all Cedar software. Be all right in March. <laughs> We're going to read scripture because uh, scripture is true in season and out of season, whether it's Caesar season or ragweed season or bowl season, is the season for the Word of God. So we read from Isaiah, the, the uh, uh, 20, 42nd chapter, the first through the ninth verse. Here is my shepherd, on whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not burn, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not uh, grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice on the earth. In the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, uh, who brings forth breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have said, I call you in righteousness. I have token, taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, and to open the eyes of those that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeons, from the prisons who set in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other nor my praise to the idols. See the former things have come to pass, and new things I will now declare. Before they spring forth, I will I tell you of them. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Our response of reading this morning is number Psalm number 29. It's on page 761 in the hymn. And we'll use a different response from the one in the book. The words are just the last line of the song. May the Lord bless his people, bless us, with peace. And it goes like this. May the Lord bless us, 
size pool. Now that's important for the story later on. After a few lessons, we went out there regularly and then I learned to swim a little bit, I move my arms, kick my feet, do the kind of things we're supposed to do. And then one lesson before it began, one of the instructors asked a question. Now, I don't know if I was not paying attention or if I just didn't hear. But several children raised their hand. And not wanting to be left out of anything, I raised my hand too. And all those who raised their hand, he took us down towards the middle of the pool. On the, on the side. And apparently, this bunch had taken a test and swam across the shallow end of the pool, one side to the other. And now it was time for their test to swim from one side to the other in the deep end. I had never swam across the pool in the shallow end. But I was too embarrassed to say anything. So when my turn came up, I jumped in and swam for all I was worth. Now, somewhere around the middle of the pool, the other side looked like it was three miles away. And I began to panic. And I began to thrash around. And much to his chagrin, the lifeguard had to jump in the pool and come and pull me out. I was so embarrassed that I told my mother I didn't want to come back. And I didn't go back to that pool. But I did learn how to swim. Uh, in fact, uh, Boy Scouts, uh, some years later, I swam the mile. So that's quite a bit from not being able to swim across the Olympic side pool. But the reason I bring that up is because I think that swimming in the deep end is a metaphor for baptism. You see, most of the time, we're playing around in the shallow end. When I was a child, my parents kidnapped me and took me to church and made me get baptized. I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't have anything to say about it. I was too young to remember it. But they were in cahoots with this guy with robes. And they put water on my head and said, you are baptized. And it was years later before I even realized that I was baptized. And years after that before I even met in any inkling of what that meant. Now, if you're like me, your parents did that. Or maybe if they didn't do that, they waited until you were a little bit older, like 10 or 11 or 12 years old and took you down and immersed you in a Baptist or Church of Christ pool. My hunch is that you didn't know what you were doing then either. <coughs> we were playing around in the shallow end. I want to suggest to you that where real life is, <coughs> where the adventure of faith is, is when you swim in the deep end. Not playing around, you can spend some time there, but you move out into the depths of faith with Jesus. Now, to do that, I think we need to talk about what happened to Jesus. Uh, Jesus shows up for John to be baptized, for John to baptize him. He's about 30 years old. Now, the reason why they assume that he's 30 is not because of anything that's in the Bible, but because of Jewish custom. The Jewish, the Jewish custom was that you didn't know anything worth saying until you were 30 years old. That you didn't have enough life in you, that you didn't have enough experience, that you haven't been through enough things in life to have anything worth listening to. Which is just the opposite of our culture, isn't it? We value teenagers. We value 20-somethings. Uh, 
Uh, we, we listen to what they have to say. The, the old folks, are, they're just out of, out of date. They're, they're passe. They don't know enough. Their life has changed. They don't have anything to say worth listening to. They were the opposite. When you were young, you didn't have anything worth listening to. When you got older, that's when you do something. So Jesus was probably 30 years old when he showed up to begin his ministry with John. Now, the Jewish faith had some instances of purification, of, of bathing, of ritual bathing. Uh, you remember uh, the story of the, the uh, turning water into wine at the wedding of Canaan in Galilee? That's one of the more infamous and uh, often joked about uh, miracles of Jesus. But they were contained in large 30 gallon jugs, uh, barrels that were going to be used for purification. That meant that if you were sick or you had something wrong with you, you went through this ritual bathing to show that you were healthy, that you were well again. It also meant that if you went awry spiritually and morally, that you had a cleansing way to repent and turn and be part of the community again. That's what the ritual bathing is. But John had something else in mind. He looked out across the culture and said, this is perverted. This is messed up. The Romans come <coughs> and worship other gods. They run the country. The Jewish leaders, religious leaders, uh, accommodate to them. They compromise the faith. They pervert the commandments of God. This is wrong. So I want everyone to turn and repent. Now, it's, it's one thing to be individually repent and say, I've done something wrong, I need to go in a new direction. But John is calling the whole culture to change. He said, now is the time to turn and go in a new direction. <coughs> to be committed as a group, as a culture, as a whole society for something different, to look Godward. And Jesus said, I want to be part of that. It's not so much that Jesus had anything to repent of, but he knew that the culture needed repenting, and he wanted to be part of it. So that's important to remember. This is not individualistic, it's societal. For the whole society to repent. Now Jesus goes down, into the water, it comes up, and some three amazing things happen. First of all, the heavens opened up. Now, what that meant was that there was a, they felt there was a dividing a division between heaven and earth, and that broke down. That God was present. The power and majesty of God was right there. There was no division. There was no Nobody, it was no uh, problem of seeing God because God, uh, the heavens opened up and God was right there. And the second thing that happened was that uh, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. The Holy Spirit meant that what Jesus was about to do was not of his own making. He was not just a good guy who was an effective teacher and a miracle worker he was, a, he was the Son of God. By the power of God, he was going to do what he was going to do. And then a voice came down, this is my son. This is not your run-of-the-mill miracle worker, your, your prophet, your teacher. This is the real thing. This is the essence of what life is about. If you want to know what God is like and what God intended in living, look at Jesus. This is my son. And on the basis of that identity, he's going to go into the world changing lives, changing culture, changing the world. He's going to offer, instead of hatred, he's going to offer love. Instead of 
rejection, he's going to respond with acceptance. Instead of judgment, he's going to respond with forgiveness. He's taking on an entirely different culture. This is different than anything anybody had known. This is different than human tendency. If you, it's a lot different than the society which is self-serving and self-indulgent, who works on the basis of profit, of, uh, of, uh, of power and, uh, and submission, on the basis of position and wealth. This was entirely different based on his identity, because he is the son of God. Now, I think we swim in the same waters of baptism. That the division between us and the divine has become very thin. We can see God when we see Jesus that the power of God has come in the Holy Spirit and it is available to us, that we have a new identity that's not normally our own, it's one that God gave us. It says, you are my son, you are my daughter. And so we jump in the pool with Jesus and stand against the culture even though the culture doesn't understand and sometimes tries to crush us. Because it can't stand a godly person. Someone who can't be controlled by fear. To stand against the culture of the society that has all the things that the majority of folks understand. It means standing against the flow of culture. It's hard, but it's where the depth of life is. It's where the adventure of faith is lived out. And most of the time, we pedal around in the shallow end. God invites us to jump into the deep end of faith. But don't worry. You can't drown because there's a lifeguard on duty. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we feel God's presence and know God's word, and we respond with our affirmation of faith, number 881 in the back of the hymn, let us stand so we show the world what we stand for. I believe in God the Father Almighty.
and upon his gifts of bread and cups. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his word. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory and joy. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. You know, when uh, Jesus took bread, it didn't matter how much bread. So we're taking this and breaking it and remembering Christ's sacrifice for us. We lift up the cup and ask God's blessing upon us. That he, uh, bless, blessing upon us that it become for us a source of healing and wholeness, a source of forgiveness. A cup of life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have been waiting for us at this table, waiting to receive us into your fellowship, to feed us and send us out into the deep waters of faith. May we receive what you have for us and go willingly into the world to be Christ to the world. In Christ's name we pray.